The first installment of Russell Dutterman's X Women Costumes Throughout the Years series was none other than the Marvel Girl herself, Jean Grey, and it served as the variant cover for the debut issue of the Krakoa era X Men number one. This was the image that started the trend of Russell Dutterman's costume series, in which other prominent X people are featured, such as Storm, Psylocke, Rogue, Emma Frost, and now Wolverine. He's recently begun moving into Avengers territory as well, but there are still tons of X people who have been waiting patiently for the Dutterman treatment, so I hope he hasn't changed camps permanently. I swear to god, if we don't get a Kitty Pride cover featuring all of her fashion faux pas over the years, I will stage riot. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at all the costumes featured on this Jean Grey image, putting them into a personal ranking based on my personal tastes, and I'll provide a little bit of her history about who Jean was and what she was up to during each of these eras. There are a lot more Jean Grey outfits out there than just these ones, so it's not like this cover boasts the mother load of Jean's wardrobe, but it certainly does hit all of her highlights, so I can see why he chose the costumes he did. Still, I lament on her astral plane armor and her Sunset Grace cover outfit being notable exclusions here. I mean, those two are pretty deep dives, so I'm not surprised to not see them here, but still, choices. When it comes to thinking of who the most popular X-Man is on the squad, there are a number of contenders that come to mind. Wolverine, of course, is one of them, and Storm is another, but I gotta say, ever since I first started being on YouTube and Instagram and X-Twitter, the love the fandom has given for Miss Grey feels almost unparalleled to any other character. If I had to base my opinion on who the fans love the most, just based on the content that gets posted the most frequently, then Jean wins hands down. Everyone just seems to eat her up. I, on the other hand, am not quite as much of a Jean stan as everyone else seems to be. She's certainly not an annoying character to me, nor do I loathe to read anything with her in it. I actually do find her sassy spiritedness to be quite enjoyable. I just find that she falls in like the middle of the pack for me in terms of characters that I actively want to see more of. I might be in the minority here, but I loved it when Jean was dead, mostly because I think that Cyclops and Emma dynamic is so much more palpable than the Jean and Cyclops relationship, so with her off the board, it really gave those two time to find each other. Not that Scott and Jean aren't the signature ex-couple, because they totally are and they do work well together, I just thought that Emma and Scott had a lot more flavor and Jean and Scott together feels, well, kinda tired. Her relationship with Cyclops aside though, I also think that Jean as a standalone character verges on being way too overpowered and thus boring. I get that that's her thing, she's like Omega everything, but as any dramatic storyteller can tell you, nothing is more boring than an overpowered hero. They are only as interesting as their weaknesses and flaws and challenges, so for Marvel to make her a veritable superwoman without a clear Achilles heel, she verges on being kind of boring sometimes to me. Luckily, Jean has a very fiery spirit as a character, and so her dialogue is usually always quite charismatic to read. It's just her battles that are kind of a downer for me. It's like she can just wipe the floor with everyone all the time, and that's just not very exciting from an anticipation standpoint. It's predictable, and so it's a buzzkill. I would love a story where Jean's powers suddenly get halved forever, and she's no longer the Omega that she is now. They kind of did that with like Teen Jean when the original five came to the present, but it was kind of backwards because it was more about young, not so powerful Jean realizing the true potential of Omega-ness that she could achieve and her pursuit in getting there. I do like that the Jean character has grown a lot from her teen years because she certainly wasn't the powerhouse that she is now back when she was sporting those original blue and yellows and was struggling to lift an apple. So in that respect, it's been great character development for her, but it's almost too developed and it's like, well, where can they take her now? Maybe that's why she was dead for so long, because it's hard to give her a compelling story now that she's essentially goddess-like. All of that aside though, I do think Jean is a fine character, and as I said, I am happy that she's got charisma and a fun personality, even if her power set is a bit too overpowered. 
But just because she's got it all going on from a superhero front, it doesn't mean she's always super fashionable. Just like any other X-Man, she has had both hits and misses in her costuming, and I am happy to be the judge, jury, and executioner of them all. So without further ado, let's get into the ranking. Here are 17 Jean Grey costumes ranked from my least favorite to my most favorite. Number 17, Ultimate Jean. First up is Ultimate Universe Jean. The costuming of Earth 1610 really didn't nail it for me, and if you check out my other costume ranking videos, you'll find that pretty much all of the Ultimate Universe threads usually end up right around the same number here. Jean was one of Xavier's founding X-Men members in the Ultimate Universe, just like her 616 counterpart was, and also like her 616 self, she got involved in some Phoenix-like stories because who is Jean Grey without the Phoenix? This Jean was actually almost driven insane by her immense psychic powers and was in an asylum when Xavier first found her, which is kind of funny because in the mainstream universe, a similar situation kind of sorta happened to Jean's number one rival, Emma Frost. Emma was institutionalized by her parents because of her powers when she was younger, and she was discovered by Magneto and used by him to further his brotherhood's goals. I just like that these two women have similarities in some respect, considering that they hate each other's guts, even if they are similarities from different universes. Something else that was notably different about this ultimate gene was that she first started a relationship with Wolverine instead of Cyclops, but after she discovered Wolvie was a mole working for Magneto, she dumped his ass and settled into the stability of Scott Summers. Now, in terms of this outfit, I think it's kind of wonky. There's not a lot of distinct personality in it, but I don't really think they're supposed to be since the entire Ultimate X Squad was wearing a variation of blue and yellow like this, and in particular, the women. I am usually totally on board for a fun crop top, but the emphasis has to be on fun and there's nothing really snazzy or exciting about this one. The most unique thing about it is probably that giant yellow collar, but that's way more of like an eyesore than it is any kind of beautification for this garment, as it's just bulky and like the way it meets that X symbol on her chest there just makes the whole thing look like a spacesuit necklace or something. This outfit is fine as standalone training X gear, but as far as a unique take on costuming for Jean Grey, it does not hit the mark for me. And ew, Jean with short hair is just never the look either. Number 16, Marvel Girl number 1. This costume is what Jean wore for her very first appearance way back in X-Men number 1. This is what all the X-Men were wearing at the time, as it was the debut team of the original five, and there was literally no variation between any of the costumes. Everything from the skull cap to the full body blue and yellow coveralls was all identical amongst them, except for the Beast, whose oversized feet and hands somehow got a pass for Xavier's seamstress. Even though I ranted earlier about how overpowered I find Jean Grey to be in the comics of today, in this era of her life, she was anything but. Marvel Girl was Jean when she was at her frailest, when the only power she had access to was her telekinesis. Xavier had sensed how powerful she was and blocked her telepathy for her own good, until she had a better means of controlling it herself. Throughout these early years, we watch as Jean struggles to finely tune her TK. It's easy enough for her to bluntly move objects, but heavier things are harder for her to lift at this stage, and the poor girl exerts herself and faints. Even so, she joined the team when they took on the likes of Magneto's Brotherhood and the Vanisher, and participated in all the glorious Danger Room training action that she could. This early day costume doesn't look as bad in modern day drawings of it, especially not when the whole team is together, but like, come on, there's nothing particularly fabulous about it either. It looks like it's ill-fitting and bunchy and just like super awkward for Jean. She looks a little bit spooky with her skull cap, which adds the slightest bit of appeal to this costume for me, but overall, this isn't Jean in her element whatsoever, so this costume is most definitely best left in the era in which it debuted. Number 15, Exterminator Jean. This was the costume Jean wore when she and the other original five X-Men first formed the team X-Factor, which was her first major exploit after coming back from her supposed death during the Phoenix Saga. 
Jean wasn't actually dead, but she had just been in a state of suspended animation under Jamaica Bay, healing from injuries, while Phoenix had assumed her form for a while, and after Jean was reunited with her original five teammates and brought up to speed on everything that happened since her extended absence, she and the boys decided to work together again to further Xavier's dream, and thus they created X Factor. Jean's telepathy was shot, so she only had access to her telekinesis around this point, and she started rekindling her relationship with Cyclops, even though he was married to the Jean lookalike Madeline Pryor, but Jean didn't exactly know that at the time. X-Factor itself was a front where the team posed as humans who were mutant hunters, with the reputation of capturing mutants and bringing them into their compound for persecution, when in reality, the team was actually rescuing mutants and bringing them to a training facility where they could help hone their skills and powers. Jean wore two different costumes around this time. There was her drab, fake mutant hunter persona, X-Factor costume, and there was this one, which was her actual superhero X-Factor costume. The team couldn't risk letting the public know that they were mutants posing as mutant hunters, but they still encountered situations that ultimately required the use of their superpowers, so publicly, when they were out in their mutant uniforms, they were dubbed the Exterminators. I don't find this costume to be particularly flattering for Jean. It's got that awkward face keeny thing that her first Marvel Girl costume also had, and I just rarely feel like Jean ever looks her best when her face is all covered up like that. Especially the top part, because it kind of gives her like a bald cap impression, which really isn't the greatest look for Jean at all, though I bet Xavier would disagree. Something with the shaping of this outfit also feels off to me, and it kind of looks like she's in a tube sock or something. I know the outfit is supposed to be constructed of like, basically form-fitting spandex, so it shouldn't be anything less than perfect on her curves, but maybe it's the way the design flows around the body that's throwing me off because something about it makes the outfit just look kinda clumpy. It actually reminds me a lot of Diamond Lil's outfit, just for the keech factor, and I don't mind Diamond Lil's outfit so much, but this one is not the look for Jean. Overall, I liked Jean in this early X-Factor era of reforming the original five and rescuing mutants in secret, but I don't really care for her costuming choice. Number 14, X-Men Blue. I'll just get it out of the way now and say that all of Jean's younger years aren't rated very highly in this ranking, not even her younger years that were set in the modern day. This is the outfit Jean Grey wore when she was time displaced along with the other O5 X-Men and brought from the past into the present by Beast. Beast was worried with the dark road he saw Cyclops going down with his mutant revolution, and he wanted Cyclops to meet his younger self in order to remind him of the essence of Xavier's dream and what they were all really fighting for. Instead, what ended up happening was the O5 got stuck in the present for a number of years, where they had various adventures both together and apart from one another, before eventually being sent back into the past with their memories blocked of this ever happening. One of the misadventures they got into was whenever they formed the X-Men Blue team, which was them operating under the guidance of Magneto. Jean was the team's leader, and they did a bunch of weird things like go into space and have their own mini cross-time caper, but one of Jean's most formidable moments from the series was whenever she went up against the present-day Emma Frost all by herself and overpowered her. And so we got to see a bit of a throwdown of these two once and future rivals. I was not a fan of when the time-displaced X-Men were kicking around, only because I knew the entire time that the only way for this to end was for them to eventually go back to their own timeline without any memory of this ever happening. So the whole time that they were here, it just felt like it was going to be somewhat of a blip for me. It's not like anything super long-lasting or super character-developing could ever have happened to them, because their memories had to be wiped before they left, or else it would have disrupted the entire chronology of X-Men. Granted, their presence in the present did impact the modern-day heroes in various ways, like it led to Iceman's coming out, or should I say pushing out, thank you Jean Grey, but in terms of these original five characters, nothing long-lasting was ever really in the cards for them. And as far as this outfit goes, it's just blech. It feels too kitty and boring for me, even though I know she's just a young teenager here, so it couldn't be anything too extravagant in the first place. I just don't think there's anything iconic going on. The most unique thing about it is that it has a track jacket, but even that doesn't add anything exceptional because the track jacket is designed with the exact same big yellow X that it's covering up on her bodysuit anyway. So with or without the jacket, you're still getting the same look, just a slightly different silhouette. And the hair, again, short is just not it for Jean. 
Number 13, Marvel Girl number 2. Jean's second official superhero costume is only marginally better than her first one, if only because now we are finally starting to see some personality from her. This outfit debuted in X-Men number 27, where Jean slightly redesigned everyone's costumes, but really, hers was the most dramatic change, as everyone else pretty much just swapped their yellow belts for red belts. This was still early days for the X-Men, and Jean was technically only supposed to be on the team part-time, as she was currently going to college to get a proper education, but she was still fighting super criminals as often as she was not. The X-Men fought lots of people who they would go on to fight for many, many more years, like the Juggernaut, but then they also fought people who the X-Comics would never see again, like the Warlock and Mechano. This costume really didn't last too long, only about like 10 issues or so, but I gotta say, switching out that skullcap for the pointy cat mask was probably the best thing she ever did. Not only does it give her a much more dramatic presence on the battlefield, but it also frees up that hair to let loose and live free. She gave herself a deep, plunging neckline in this costume too, and all of these subtle changes really femmed up her outfit, and I think just made it look a lot more like it belonged to her, as opposed to her just wearing something that literally everybody else was wearing too. Number 12, Marvel Girl Mini Dress. Jean has had her fair share of iconic costumes throughout the years, and this green mini dress is now officially one of them as well. Not only is this the outfit she wore when all the X-Men finally started wearing individual costumes, but it's also the one she's been wearing for pretty much the entire duration of the present-day Krakoan X-Men era. When she first started wearing this costume, Jean's telepathy had only just become active after Professor X undid the mental barriers he previously put into place. He did this because he and Jean had to fake his death for a while, and he knew the team would need a telepath as a replacement for him, so Jean was it. And then, as they say, the rest is history in terms of development of those powers. Jean also started her modeling career around this time, mostly as just a front for whenever she had to go on super secret X-Men missions, but modeling was all the rage for the Marvel ladies of this era, so like the signature superheroine sash belt, it's just a rite of passage that Jean had to have a modeling career too. This was also the costume that she was wearing when she and the other X-Men were captured by Krakoa, and the second Genesis team of Storm and Wolverine and all them had to save them. This resulted in Jean quitting the team to try living a regular life, until a certain fiery bird beckoned her back into it. Then, of course, fast forward to today, when Jean is wearing this costume yet again, and doing all sorts of Omega-level things, like sitting on the Krakoan Quiet Council making laws, participating in some nasty X-Force business, terraforming Mars for the Araco mutants, and now co-leading the latest and greatest team of X-Men. If I'm being honest about this belted green mini dress, I really don't mind it at all, but I don't think it translates as well in the modern era of costume wearing as I think Marvel wants it to. I know Krakoa is all about exploring the costumes of yore, but this costume is just so very specific and distinct, and she's been wearing it so much that the more I see of it now, the more I really start to hate it. I think for the time it debuted in, it really worked, because there's something moddy and like, Austin Powers go-go dancery about it, so I think the vibe of the dress totally encapsulated the times back then, but likewise, that works against it in today's books, since those aren't the vibes readers are really looking for these days in their superhero costuming. I like the mask, even though it is probably the most ostentatious part of the entire outfit, and definitely the most costumey, if you know what I mean, and I just think that if the simple green dress was modernized a bit with like some zhuzh, kind of like how Polaris is wearing a funner version of a green mini dress as her current costume, then the whole ensemble might actually be more palatable and refreshing, other than just being a reminder of why some costumes from the past are better left in the past. Number 11, New X-Men. New X-Men is often lauded as one of the best X-Men runs out there, though for everyone who loves it, there's usually someone who hates it, so it really just depends on what you're looking for in comics. I personally did not read the comics around the time New X-Men came out, mostly because I was just so angry with Marvel for taking the color out of the X-Men's costumes. 
everyone was wearing dark, drab, leathery costumes for this series, which, to me, was motivated because of the X-Men movies, and I hated watching the film's influence trickle down into my books. I loved the X-Men movies, but I never really liked their costuming in the films, and so then to see that costuming reflected in the books was just too much for me. I do think that this new X-Men run is one of the best storytelling eras out there though, so my bad for dissing it when it came out, but I stand by the fact that the costumes are way too functional and dressed down for my personal preference. I generally don't like it when my superheroes are looking super relatable, like Jean is here with her turtleneck and sensible slacks. I want my X-Men to always look extraordinary because I'm really not looking for this level of reality when I'm reading comic books. Jean was one of the major players in New X-Men, and it was probably one of her strongest eras ever. She became the headmistress for Xavier's school, which was open to the public and taking on new students at this point, and she also caught Cyclops in a psychic affair with her rival on the team, Emma Frost. Jean and Cyclops' relationship famously deteriorated through that, though they were having lots of problems anyway even before the affair, and honestly, this rocky road is one of the best things to ever happen to them. The Phoenix, or some part of her power calling itself the Phoenix, was asserting dominance over her, and Jean's power levels were growing to extreme degrees, and she was doing incredible things like repairing Emma Frost on a molecular level after she was shattered into a million pieces in her diamond form. This era is also famous for being Jean's last era for a long while because she inevitably did what Jean Grey does best, and that is, of course, die. After the Phoenix Force was fully awakened within her, she had a showdown with Magneto or Zorn or Zornito, still not totally sure on that canon, and she was killed after an electromagnetic pulse from him blew her to smithereens. It's old hat for Jean to die, but this death really stuck for a long time, and she didn't properly return to comics until like 13 years later, which is very commendable for Marvel considering that adult Jean Grey is like one of their hottest IPs. So yeah, this era had Jean being super busy and being super powerful, and she was involved in some really great dramatic personal tension with a lot of her colleagues. So overall, some fantastic stories for Jean and New X-Men. It's just a shame that all of them happened while she was wearing a costume that looks like she got it from the wild side of Reitman's. She's lucky that the sum of the parts at least looks good together here, so I can't really fault her styling. I just wish she looked more like a superhero and less like a soccer mom. Number 10, X-Factor Gene number 2. After X-Factor's supposed identities as mutant hunters was discovered to be nothing but a ruse, the team gave superheroing their full-time attention and ditched the exterminator's persona to be X-Factor mutants through and through. Probably the biggest thing to happen to Jean during this period was during the Inferno saga, when she learned that Madeline Pryor was her clone. This ultimately meant that Maddie's and Cyclops' son was kind of her son too, and Jean was forced to absorb the crazed Madeline psyche into herself, which kind of reconciled with her own memories so that she was also able to remember the times that Maddie and Scott shared together as if they were her own. This became problematic for her later though, as both the Madeline personality and a bit of the Phoenix Force that was inside of her would all try to become dominant over her own personality. But luckily, Jean was able to drive them all out of her when the team was battling the Celestials, and she soon returned to being the Jean that she once was, but with faded memories from both Phoenix and Madeline forever haunting the back of her mind. This is also the costume she was wearing when she famously began her hateful relationship with Rachel Summers, who was her daughter from another timeline. Jean pretty much wanted nothing to do with her because she hated how her life was always being dictated by forces that were beyond her control, and because of that, she kind of rejected Rachel and wasn't exactly the mother figure that Rachel had been hoping she would be. It was definitely a wild time to be Jean Grey, and I think this outfit is the first one on this list that I can honestly say feels a lot like her. This outfit is very much just a recolored and slightly tweaked version of her original X-Factor costume, but my god, do the changes ever improve it. Jean will forever look awesome in red, as the color just wholly embodies her. 
It's her nickname for good reason, and even though it could be seen as red overload when you look at both her big, bountiful, flowy red hair with that almost all red costume, it really isn't overload, and I think the costume looks super cohesive for her. Even though I don't think fully capped headgear is really Jean's thing, I think she looks ravishing when she's just wearing a basic superhero mask like this one that's only partially covering her face. It really adds an extra element of mystique to Jean's character because she's not really the most mysterious person out there, so anytime we can get some extra oomph in her superheroing costume, I say she should go for it. I really enjoyed this era of Jean's life almost as much as I enjoyed her costuming around this era too. Number 9, Black Queen Jean. So, I'm not really going to go into the whole minutia of who was Jean Grey and who was Phoenix around this time of her life because I think it's enough to accept that, for all intents and purposes, at the time of publishing, this was Jean Grey. And so, even if it was just the Phoenix using her likeness, for the sake of this video, we're just going to go with Jean. The Black Queen was the beginning of Jean's corruption into Dark Phoenix. Mastermind had been toying with her mind, making her believe that she and he were lovers, to the point that she could no longer distinguish reality from fiction, and she was fully immersed in his manipulation, even so far as being tricked into joining the Hellfire Club as their newest Black Queen. She turned against her X-Men teammates, believing them to be her wretched servants and slaves in his 18th century illusion, and she helped to torture and almost kill them while they were all kidnapped and held prisoner by the club. In effect, the Black Queen persona didn't really last too long, it was really only for a handful of issues, but definitely this version of Jean has gone down in history as one of the most memorable ones. I personally am kind of split on it though, because to me, the ultimate black queen was and only ever will be Selene. So when I see this version of a black queen get praise, I can't help but feel a little bit petulant about it. But be it Selene or be it Jean Grey, the black queen garb is iconically BDSM, which is exactly what we want from it. I do think Selene wears it better than Jean, and she definitely has had greater variations of it over the years. But I think, as far as a debut for the Black Queen role goes, this outfit definitely does it justice. This is also the first time I think we would ever have seen Jean in anything like this. Prior to now, she was always like the prim and proper one who had like a bit of sass, but never really wore anything too out there, nor behaved as daring as this persona had led her. It's like the human reflection of her descent into madness, as what comes next is certainly the cosmic reflection of it. So I think seeing Jean in this bad girl black leather is such a great departure from how she had been depicted leading up to this, and also kind of a relatable one too, because who doesn't go for whips and chains and spikes when they're first deciding to be a little rebellious? Number 8, X-Men Red. X-Men Red was Jean Grey's grand return to the Marvel Universe after her long death from New X-Men. Even though the teenage version of her had been running around for a few years during her deceasement, she was no substitute for the real deal, and after a little bit of that old Phoenix magic, adult Jean Grey finally regraced the X-Books once more after having been dead for, what was that, a solid 13 or 15 years? She returned during a miniseries that was aptly titled Phoenix Resurrections, The Return of Jean Grey, but then pretty much immediately she went straight to work in X-Men Red. There, she led her own team of X-Men and worked to better the world for all mutants by trying to forge a mutant nation, which is exactly what it sounds like Krakoa is, but Jean's version didn't really take off, and I'd say the biggest thing to come out of her series was her fight with Cassandra Nova, where she gave Cassandra the capacity to feel empathy, which supposedly made her change her ways. Jean also wore this when she was with the Uncanny X-Men who ambushed Nate Grey ahead of his big reality warp into the Age of X-Men, and she was still wearing it after they returned and she was reunited with Cyclops for the first time since her resurrection. He too had just recently been resurrected, so it was a lovely homecoming for both of them right before Krakoa took over the world. As far as this outfit goes, there's not a lot to hate here. It's very much a play off of her 90s gold team outfit, right down to the construction of the faceplate and the body armor, albeit this one has a bit of a different color scheme overall. 
Although I like the homage because the 90s one is so extra. I look at this and I think it might just be a little bit too understated. Like, it feels as though it's missing a few frills here and there. I think it's because I'm accustomed to the pomp and circumstance of the original one that this is based off of, and so it's by no means an insult to this design as a whole, but I mean, that's what's going to happen if you use a previous design as your template. People are intrinsically going to be drawn to compare it to the original, and sometimes it lives up, and sometimes it doesn't. I do really like this outfit, and I think it was a great design for her return, and I actually wish that she had carried it into Krakoa with her instead of going back to the mini dress, but I guess it just wasn't to be, or at least it wasn't to be yet. Number 7, First Class. I was shocked whenever I made this ranking and saw how high up this first class outfit was being ranked. I thought for sure that all of her really early costumes were going to get over and done with at the top because I generally don't really like any of them, but something about this one just really worked for me. This was the outfit Jean wore during the X-Men First Class series. This book explored adventures of the original X-Men in untold tales that we've never seen before. It's different than the X-Men The Hidden Year series in that that series specifically told stories that were meant to fill in the gaps of the reprint years when Marvel was only publishing reprints of X-Men. X-Men First Class, however, was set in a time before the reprints, I think, when everyone was still wearing matching costumes and before Jean had access to her telepathy. The stories are meant to be in continuity, even though, of course, there will always be a few things that don't end up making sense when you go back into the canon this way, but nothing substantial really stood out for Jean from what I can remember. Honestly, the comics were kind of messy, with like multiple stories sometimes being told within the same comic. It was more like a magazine than a single thought sometimes, and there would be comics within the comics between the characters, like a time when Jean helped Wanda and the two of them dress up as each other. I don't know if those little like mini comics were supposed to be in continuity as the rest of the series was, just given the artistic style of them, but I mean whatever, they were there, and if they're in continuity then so be it. Probably the best thing to come of this series was the costuming. I'm usually a big naysayer for matchy-matchy costumes, because I think they stifle the characters' individual personalities, but I think they nailed it with these ones. They've definitely got the first-class vibe of being all yellow and blue, but because they were drawn with a modern pencil, they aren't nearly as schlumpy as the actual first-class costumes look. They actually kind of look like they could be worn in a contemporary team setting, and they kind of remind me of what the New Mutants all wore during Volume 3 of their series when they were all on Utopia together. Jean's costume in particular, I think, looks great on her. Even though her operatic yellow gloves do kind of look campy and bunchy, I think that's on purpose as like a nod to the era of the times back then. The costume can't look too sleek because there still had to be some sort of evolution to come in her costuming since this wasn't actually set in modern day, even though it was being drawn by modern day artists. I really like the color blocking design with that little X symbol on her stomach, and that cat burglar mask across her face just makes her look really cool, and I think all of it really makes the red of her hair pop, which is really what we want from our Jean Grey. Number 6, Revolution. The Revolution era was Chris Claremont's grand return to the X-Comics after being away for many, many years, and he decided to kick things off by shaking them up majorly. He redesigned everybody's costumes and introduced a six-month gap where God knows what happened, except the big thing for Jean was that during that six-month gap, she and Psylocke somehow managed to switch power sets, where Jean lost her telekinesis to Betsy and thus was rendered only telepathic, but with Betsy's telepathy the amplifying her own. While I'm still personally waiting for more details on that six month gap to hopefully be revealed in an upcoming X-Men Legends issue, what was cool about the power swap was that Jean also gained a semblance of Psylocke's Crimson Dawn ability, as her astral image would now manifest itself in the same shadowy form that it would for Psylocke since being touched by the powers of the Dawn. This plot point was abandoned almost as soon as it was conceived though, and we don't really know what happened with Jean, nor with her shadowy astral self. The X-Men were split into two teams again for this revolution, and Jean was on a globe-trotting team with Beast, Storm, Gambit, and Cable, and they had a few fun misadventures, but probably one of the more interesting things for Jean was that whenever she was contacted by the only surviving member of the alien Dabari race that Dark Phoenix had unintentionally massacred. 
She was forced to relive the events from his perspective, as well as the Phoenix's, and decided that the best way for her to right this wrong now was to claim the Phoenix name and make it a force for good and not for evil. The Revolution era was met with a lot of disdain from fans when it first debuted, but I think attitudes towards it have softened over the years in retrospect, and now it's kind of like a guilty pleasure era. I personally really wasn't too fond of a lot of the costume designs for the team, but I honestly think that Jean escaped with one of the better ones here. It's got the obvious nod to the phoenix in the front, but it's also got that gorgeous red and gold color scheme that we love to see her in. I think the way the phoenix sigil falls off her shoulders like that is really elegant. Almost too elegant for a crime fighting outfit, but she just looks so pretty that it's hard to fault her for it. I don't care for Jean to always be associated with the Phoenix Force, so that's why this costume can't really stand the test of time for me as a modern interpretation of her character, but at the time of its debut, when Jean and the Phoenix were still plot points for each other, and just as an overall fashionable, elegant look, I think this costume is really nice and that it suits Jean really well. Number 5, Phoenix. Speaking of Phoenix, it's about to get all Phoenix mania up in here. This, of course, is the costume that Jean Grey wore when she wasn't Jean Grey at all, but was the cosmic phoenix force taking on her form and joining the X-Men on submissions. Again, not gonna get into the minutia of who was Jean and who was Phoenix Force, so let's just go with whatever I'm saying here. The X-Men were on a space mission that went awry, and only Jean could save the X-Men by using a telekinetic shield as their shuttle crashed back down to Earth. But through the immense strain and process, her body burned up through the atmosphere and she supposedly died. Luckily, she had been spied on by the cosmic entity known as the Phoenix Force, which wrapped her in a psychic cocoon to preserve her life, and in the meantime, decided to pose as her to not arouse suspicion, and also to get a taste of what human life was like. Without a doubt, this is one of Jean's most popular incarnations, and definitely one of comic book history in general's most popular characters too. When Phoenix first showed up, she pushed Jean's power to limits that the X-Men had never before seen from her. From a storytelling perspective, this was a beautiful thing to witness. Even though Jean always had the potential to be great and powerful, she certainly wasn't the heavy hitter back then that she is today, at least not until the Phoenix starts showing her the way. This is the glory of what can come from not overpowering characters from the very beginning. It gives them room to grow and to create new stories where they can reach their upper potentials and any ramifications that might come from that. People laugh at Jean's animated series depiction because she's so weak and frail and falling all the time and calling for Scott, but what they did was create a character who had lots of room to grow so that when the Phoenix arc did come around, Jean was a plausible candidate as a character that could show outrageous levels of growth and her abilities that she hadn't shown before and also be somewhat corruptible. This is why the animated series is like the only media franchise outside of comics to have ever actually done the Phoenix Saga justice, because they were able to establish Jean's limitations early on and really go into it whenever the Phoenix possessed her. But anyway, enough of that. Phoenix helped the X-Men on various missions, like against Mesmero after he hypnotized them all into believing that they were circus workers, and when the X-Men went back up into space to save the universe from the M-Cron crystal. Phoenix was doing her thing with all of her cosmic powers, and truly was a very captivating character. Now, this outfit doesn't really scream cosmic by today's standards, and maybe not even by yesterday's standards either, but it certainly is iconic, which is a word I've been throwing around a lot here. The image of Jean bursting out of Jamaica Bay in the green and gold Phoenix bodysuit is literally one of the most powerful moments in comic book history, and I'm sure it's burned into pretty much every comic book nerd's brain. I think this costume looks great overall. It's nothing to write home about when you really dissect it, because it's really just a green bodysuit with a sash belt and some boots and gloves, but I think it's mostly who she became when she wore this costume that really sells the garment for us. 
They say performance is half the battle with anything you wear, and Jean definitely won the war when she wore this. The gold gloves and boots really have that shiny, liquid, metallic, lame kind of feel that I think also adds a sense of supernatural to this costume, which is necessary because otherwise it's just a green bodysuit. But the choice of colors, again, really makes that red hair of hers pop, and so that's why I think from head to toe, this costume is a very functional, fearing on gaudy costume for Jean that actually does stand the test of time. Not that I need to see her wear it ever again, though, because she's worn this or a version of this so many times now that I'm just ready for it to be mounted and laid in the X-Men Hall of Fame and for Jean to keep on wearing new clothes instead. Number four, Dark Phoenix. All right, let's try to get through this one quickly. This is basically just a recolored version of her good girl Phoenix costume, but I mean, come on, this is the one. The deep, dark red with that liquidy gold and the huge Phoenix emblem across her chest not only tells me everything I need to know about this character at this moment in time, but also it tells me that bad girls really do have more fun. This is the costume that Jean slash the Phoenix Force wore when she was fully corrupted into becoming the Dark Phoenix. She had a taste of humanity with the X-Men and got to experience the sunshine and lollipop side of life, but then through Mastermind's illusions and the temptation of evil, Phoenix became dark and just a fully bad bitch. This is the guise she wore when she famously massacred 5 billion Dabari aliens by swallowing their son, and then was later put on trial for her crimes by Lilandra of the Shi'ar Empire, where the X-Men were forced to fight for Jean Grey's life against the Imperial Guard. The Dark Phoenix really only lasted for like a handful of issues, but my god, what a powerful few issues they were. The X-Men's fight against the Imperial Guard ended in the now morally recalibrated Phoenix committing suicide in front of Cyclops so that her dark self would never ever re-emerge. And honestly, had that been the end of it, and had Jean been the X-Men's Uncle Ben and never come back, it would have been such a beautifully tragic end. I'm certainly not mad at all the retcons and that Jean has always come back to life because I think she is a great pillar to have in the X-Men franchise, but let's be real, it sure did sacrifice that ending. This costume feels like it was the inspiration for Jean's revolution costume. It's the same color scheme and basically the same design, and I think it was good of Jean to take ownership of this moment and turn it into one she could call her own since the Dark Phoenix is probably a dark memory for her. This version of the costume has shown up a few other times in contemporary costumes as well, like during the Phoenix End Song miniseries, when Jean had to stop the Phoenix Force from being brought back down to Earth, as she usually does. And I really do think that when they are paired together, this red one just looks way sleeker and more fun than the green one does. Villains usually do have the better end of the deal when it comes to liberties and dressing in fun costumes, and so it's no surprise to me that I do prefer the red one, since I like to fashion myself a bit of a villain as well. Number 3. X-Factor Jean number 3. You want to talk about underrated costumes? Jean's final X-Factor costume is, like, at the top of that list. This was the costume Jean wore when the original X-Men were finishing up their run as X-Factor before heading back to the mansion to form the X-Men teams of the 90s. Most of X-Factor had adopted a similar look to this costume, with Cyclops and Iceman both sharing the overall design, and I gotta say, again, for someone who doesn't really like it when team costumes match, I really, really, really liked these costumes. Jean's X-Factor costuming goes through a pretty evident evolution from the very beginning to now, but when you stack them all side by side, it's clear to see that they were all designed to live kind of within the same family. They are all bodysuits with some sort of facial masking, and all with the giant X across the chest and some sort of lining down the sides. There's nothing too ornate or ostentatious in any of them, and I think it might be this final X-Factor costume that is the most embellished of all of them, if only because of those fantastic shoulder pads she's wearing. Wow, talk about a female power flex. 
These are some of the sharpest shoulders I have not just seen Jean wear, but seen any superheroine wear. And it's not like she's even being subtle about them. The rest of the costume is very form-fitting, just like all the other ones have been. But then when you get to the shoulders, it's like schling, slice and dice time. They are a deliberate choice, and they are a choice I love. I think they make her stand out in the best possible way, and it's really a shame that this costume only lasted for a few issues before the 90s took over. Even though Jean didn't have the chance to do much whilst in this costume, she was party to one of the most important things to happen in the X-Men's world, and that was sending little baby Nathan Christopher into the future so that the Ascani could help him deal with the techno-organic virus that Apocalypse had just infected him with. This of course set into motion the inevitability of him becoming Cable, and eventually coming back to the present day to rock the X-Men's world forever. She also participated in the Muir Island saga in this time, where the Shadow King had his grasp on pretty much all the X-Men and their friends, and after she helped to defeat him, she and the rest of X-Factor finally decided to disband and rejoin the X-Men and create those blue and gold teams. Even though this costume didn't last long, it certainly holds a special place in my heart, and I'm happy that it was around for a couple monumental moments in not only Jean's life, but in the X-Men's lives as a collective whole. Number 2, Age of Apocalypse. Oh, do I ever love Jean's Age of Apocalypse outfit. For the uninformed, the Age of Apocalypse was a splinter reality that was formed after Xavier's son Legion time traveled back in time to kill Magneto, but accidentally ended up killing Charles Xavier instead. The world was thus reshaped as to what would have happened had Charles Xavier died before being able to share his dream of mutant and human peaceful coexistence. And as it turns out, what would happen is that mutant supremacy would rule through the despot Apocalypse's leadership, and life would just be all around miserable for everybody. The AOA event rocked the 90s, and either you love it or you don't really care for it, and I am certainly one of the ones who adored it. In this reality, Jean was one of the original X-Men as founded by Magneto until she was captured by Sinister and used in his experiments to create Nate Grey. She was rescued by Wolverine, and then the two of them quit the X-Men and became lovers until she was eventually captured again by Apocalypse and was supposedly killed by Havoc. This was a very refreshing story because it was all Jean without any mention of the Phoenix Force, and so it got to be all about her, unblemished by any cosmic forces. But as they say, no good deed goes unpunished, and that eventually turned sour in later AOA revisits, as the creative teams decided that Jean did survive Havoc's Plasma Blast, but only thanks to the Phoenix Force. And then pretty much everything about her character and future stories became tied to her Omega Phoenix level powers, so not quite as refreshing as the first story. Like most of the AOA costumes, I really enjoyed what Jean wore. It's extremely basic, but it's the unique silhouetting that gets me every time with this reality. I don't usually care for Jean with short hair, but this is one of those rare exceptions where I think it really works. Its shortness, matched with the tattoo that's around her eye, really gives her more of like an edgy feel. And even though the clothes themselves are very simple, they are cut and assembled in a way that's pretty unique. I love that weird small dark blue jacket she's wearing. It's got puffy sleeves that gives her those big shoulders I enjoy, and I love that collar that just stops at her neck. It's definitely my favorite part of the ensemble, and it's what makes it the most unique. The rest of it is pretty standard fair superhero garb with a really sexy cut around the chest, but I think the color scheme really works for her and is a beautiful, bold new direction for Jean in this bold new world. Jean was one of my favorite characters in the AOA, and it was partially because of how she was dressed, I think. She wasn't a totally reinvented character personality-wise, as she's always had that bit of sass and independence that she carried with her into this reality, but it was especially nice to see her take Wolverine as a love interest, just to see how that helped shape her life here. I think this is when we got to see how free Jean could really be if she was paired with Logan instead of Stuffy Scott, because she definitely felt like she used her instincts a lot more and exerted her own independence more frequently here than she ever has with Psyche, and that is a version of Jean that we love to see. Number 1, 90s Gold Team. 
I kind of surprised myself whenever I made this ranking, and it was this costume that ended up being on top. I would never say that I am a slave to the 90s, as maybe some other people are. I certainly am a product of the 90s, and I adore that decade, certainly for the extremeness that it was. But I don't really define myself as the ultimate 90s X-Fan, and I am totally aware that not all of the X-Men's greatest feats occurred during that era. I think, unquestionably though, the 90s are most belovedly associated with at least the costuming of the characters, if not necessarily the actual stories featuring them, and so even though there has been a swath of different costumes for Jean that have been both newer and also potentially more iconic, I found myself always coming back to this one as the most interesting one to me. It's certainly the most excessive and the most extra, as all the 90s X-Men costumes were, but I think it's also the most definitive Jean. She's worn all kinds of headgear over the years, as we've seen, from those wretched skull caps to the cat burglar masks, but I think the best headgear that has ever worked on Jean is the headband thing, and especially this one with the little shape in the middle to really give her psychic powers some pop. It's such a subtle little moment in this costume, but it's always been my favorite thing about it, and I think it helps emphasize her role within the team without beating us over the head with it as to what her specialty is. By now, it's obvious that I have a thing for big shoulders with Jean, as my top three costumes have been Jean with her biggest shoulders everywhere, and I think this costume's shoulder armor is no exception. Though I prefer the pointed shoulders to this dome shape, it's just nice seeing someone who gives the shoulders as much love as Jean frequently does. I mean, really, everything here just works. The forearm armor and the belt and the hip pad pockets are all extra little nuances that, although probably unnecessary, give the costume that edge of making it look like a superhero costume as opposed to just looking like a, I don't know, a regular costume. Even the color scheming works. Orange and blue are weird choices that I would probably never pair together if given the choice, but on Jean here, they managed to play again off that red hair really well, and she kind of looks like a beautiful autumn melody, or at least a delicious autumn drink. I wouldn't say that the 90s were as important for Jean as they were for maybe some other characters, but she was certainly present for them. She was a member of Storm's gold team over in Uncanny X-Men, and they had some adventures like saving Emma Frost from certain death by the Sentinels and fighting some rampaging Morlocks, but probably the biggest thing to happen to Jean were things that were also tied to Cyclops. Not only did the two of them finally get married after Jean managed to kibosh Psylocke's awkward advances on him, but they were also both kidnapped and tortured by Strife, who they learned was a genetic clone of Cable, who they learned was their son Nathan Christopher, who was the kid that they sent to the future back during their X Factor days. So much going on. After their marriage, then Cyclops and Jean took a honeymoon into the future, where they managed to secretly raise him into the man he would eventually become, so it was very much a family values era for Jean. The 90s was also when Onslaught struck, and Jean had a pretty pivotal role in that arc. She was the one who sent the warning video about the traitor from within, which of course ended up being Xavier. Jean was also one of the first ex-people to fight Onslaught when she was brought inside his mind, and it's where she also learned that Xavier used to harbor some romantic feelings for her, but we ain't gonna talk about that. So yeah, 90s Jean wins the top spot in this Jean Grey costume countdown, because if it ain't got a pentagonal forehead ornamentation on it, then I'm not interested. And so that's it for this video. Jean was definitely one of the tougher ranking videos for me to make here, just because she's so, I don't know, important in the X-Men continuity, and I felt a lot of pressure to get it right, so hopefully I did and you agree with at least some of my choices. If you don't, then please feel free to let me know what your ranking is in the comments, because I always like to respectfully read what everyone else's opinions are here too. If you like this video, then please feel free to check out my channel for more X-Men videos like it. I create X-Men content of all kinds, and there's always something being uploaded every week or so, so please consider stopping by. You can also follow me on my social media channels for daily engagement, where I post comic book panels from whatever I'm reading at the moment, and usually pair them with something of a witty caption. 
I want to thank you again for spending this time with me and watching this video today, and I welcome you to come back again soon from our great X-Mentations.